Welcome to the Heroic Investing Show. As first responders, we risk our lives every day. Our financial security is under attack. Our pensions are in a state of emergency. A single on-duty incident can alter or erase our earning potential instantly and forever. We are the heroes of society. We are self-reliant and we need to take care of our own financial future. The Heroic Investing Show is our toolkit of business and investing tactics on our mission to financial freedom. Welcome to the Heroic Investing Show. My name is Gary Pinkerton and I co-host this show with Jason Hartman. This is Heroic Investing, episode 192. My guest for today's show will leave you in tremendous awe. It is severely wounded airman, triple amputee, Brian Colfage. Brian was on his second deployment as a security airman in support of Iraqi freedom when, while walking around inside the base one morning on September 11th, 2004, three years after the tragic events in the United States that led to these deployments, a 107 millimeter rocket shell exploded about three feet from him. It knocked off both of his legs and one of his arms. The fact that he was mere feet from their hospital was what resulted in him surviving this incredible attack and becoming the person most uh, severely wounded, uh, the, the airman most severely wounded in history to survive and the individual most severely wounded in the military that would walk on his own and carry on a normal life. Many people obviously wouldn't have survived that uh, event, and many people would have given up emotionally in trying to have a normal life. But Brian has a wonderful wife, beautiful children. He's carrying on a normal life, and he's doing some tremendously abnormal things. He's currently leading an effort that started as a GoFundMe project and now approaching a billion dollars has exceeded uh, the GoFundMe realm and has moved into more traditional funding. He's building a wall, mile by mile matching what President Trump is attempting to do. They're building it on private land and obviously it's less expensive and much more successful with less red tape than uh, what the government is building. He also continues to uh, visit Walter Reed Medical Center, visiting newly wounded individuals returning from war. In 2012, he was invited by Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. She's a Arizona Congresswoman, if you remember, was attacked similarly during a speech that she was giving there in Arizona. I had had dinner with her and her husband, also a veteran, just days before this, as I was visiting uh, Tucson, the host city of my submarine, the USS Tucson, with some crew members. We felt extremely closely connected to Congresswoman Giffords. It didn't come up actually during this interview, but I, you know, since recognized that he had been at the 2012 State of the Union address uh, invited by Congresswoman Giffords, and that's the one in which she resigned her position, recognizing that she was going to be unable to represent going forward with the the extent of her own injuries. With persistence and determination, he has beat all the odds stacked against him and recently was awarded one of the most prestigious military scholarships, the Pat Tillman Scholar Award. He subsequently graduated from the University of Arizona School of Architecture and continues to be a leading citizen in the United States. Please help me in welcoming Airman Brian Colfudge. Well, hello, Rogue Investing audience. Thanks so much for uh, returning again today. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of having U.S. Air Force veteran Brian Colfage. And Brian was uh, catastrophically wounded back in 2004. Has a tremendous history, as I mentioned in the biography leading up to this uh, today's event. I uh, feel incredibly honored to have Brian. He's a busy individual who is doing some amazing things in numerous different areas. And I'm going to let him talk about his most recent initiative and uh, the differences he's making for all of us out there in America. Brian, thanks so much for joining us here on Heroic Investing. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. <laughs> Brian, would you uh, take just a few moments and uh, kind of go back to um, you know, why you were serving on active duty, the changes that occurred in your life, and, and how you ended up here and what you're doing now? Well, uh, I joined the Air Force in 2001, just before 9-11. My very first day after all my training was September 11th, 2001. Wow. And uh, so I got thrust right into that. Yeah, 
yeah, I mean, that kind of set the stage for where, uh, you know, things are today. Shortly after 9 11 I deployed into Iraq during the invasion. We were the first Air Force unit on the ground in Iraq um, that, that pushed the back out. Uh, nothing really happened eventually on that uh, deployment. Very typical, I guess, for uh, deployment. And then second deployment, uh, we're going to deploy to Kuwait. Let's all appear to go run a mission in Iraq. Ultimately, a couple of weeks later, I lost my leg when a, a 107 millimeter rocket landed right next to me on 9-11-04 and uh, instantly blew off my legs in my hand. And uh, luckily I survived and uh, here I am today. Were you uh, in a combat zone? Were you in a what was expected to be a safe area at the time? Oh, well, Kuwait was very safe where we were at. And then uh, I volunteered to go to Iraq. And right. Uh, that's LSAF Anaconda, which is in Balad, Iraq. And very hot, very bad area. It's called Mortar Ritaville, which is because they launch mortars at it daily and they were basically rockets. And uh, it's a daily occurrence. It's more of a nuisance to most people and the base is so big, they really don't land close to people. Yeah, unfortunately for me, when I just had woken up on 9-11-04, walked out of my tent, walked a few feet, and one landed right next to me, the very first one. And they attacked a race pretty hardcore on that day. Uh, there was really nothing I could do to, you know, yeah. prepare for that. It just wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, but luckily, if it was going to happen, that was the place it could have it happen because the main hospital for that entire region of Iraq was literally a football field away from where I was injured. And uh, that's why I'm alive. And this, if this would have happened to me on base, I would have been dead. It all happened so fast. And the hospital and the ER, very, very fast, and it kept me alive. Appreciate you clarifying. I don't know of that many successful attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq. I mean, perhaps I'm just uninformed, but I thought we had done a pretty decent job throughout that area of conflict of protecting the bases, at least um, beyond the very close boundaries of the base. Am I wrong there? You're right, to a degree. Rockets and mortars are, are very difficult to stop, and they're fired from so far away, and they're just random. Yeah. Okay. Um, early on in 2003, you know, 2004, 2005, they're difficult to stop them. And it, it got so bad that they took these weapon systems off battleships. They're called Sea Wiz. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very familiar with them. Radar based you know, system that shoots down anything that comes at it. So they, they sell these Sea Wiz on the bases to shoot down all incoming rockets and mortars. But unfortunately for me, that was installed. I think in probably like 2006 or 2007, but early on it was like the Wild West out there. There wasn't a lot of anything for protection. We were living in tents. It was pretty wild out there. Wow. Well, thanks again, Brian, for for reliving that for our audience. And oh, no problem. And heroic investors, you can you can see some awesome videos of uh, of what the Gary Sinise Foundation does, and specifically with Brian and his family. If you go to uh, Gary Sinise's website about a home that was, was dedicated or was um, provided for, for Brian that was specialized as a smart home to, to help out him and his family. Since that period of time, you know, several years have, have passed. Brian, what, what have you been up to and what are you currently engaged with? After I got injured, I continued working for the Air Force, but as a civilian position. And uh, I work at Davis Bonham Air Force Base as a base security manager. So it was in the same career field that I had prior to being wounded, but just the best job. And it allowed me to kind of be around my, my same people, the same people I would deploy with and uh, people I do. Basically bridge the gap from, from me being wounded to me recovering and getting back out there in the, in the work environment, contributing to society. So it was a good transition for me. After two years of doing that, I just, Working the desk job wasn't for me, and, and so everyone kind of talked me into going back to school. And at that time, I was really nervous about like failing, and you know, I had just lost two limbs, three limbs, both my legs and my left and my, my right hand. So all I had left was my left hand. I decided I was going to try architecture of all things, which is, was kind of weird considering I, I lost my right hand. And uh, I really liked it, I, but I had to teach myself how to draw. How to I mean, I could even write my name. And it was just a lot of hard work. And I had to learn a lot about myself and what I was able to do. And I just basically figured out that you could do anything. It didn't matter if I lost my hands or my, my legs. I could still do this stuff. I just had to try to find a new way to do it. I had to adapt 
and just try extra hard. And I got my bachelor's degree in architecture. I graduated in 2014 from the University of Arizona. After that, uh, I started up a coffee company called Golden Great Coffee. I've been doing that ever since, and then slowly got into political stuff. And I just felt deeply invested to our country, losing my lands. And yeah, you know, I ended up having children in 2014 as well, and then 2015. And having these kids has greatly impacted me. I wanted my children to have the freedoms that we have today. You know, I think we all appreciate the political atmosphere of what's going on in our nation right now. There's a lot of, you know, everyone's well into it and concerned about things. And I was very concerned. And I started that the viral GoFundMe back in December of 2018. And it was just a knee-jerk reaction, I guess you could say. I was sick of the way things were going political for our country. It didn't seem like we were going to get border security, and our politicians were frankly just fighting over crap that wasn't getting anything done, and we elected them to get stuff done. And so I just, one night said, hey, I'm going to create a GoFundMe. Maybe I can have a difference. Maybe this will, will help uh, bring the topic back up in the news and get some people going on it. And it blew up and went viral. And so, and so bring us up to speed You're on your GoFundMe project. Where, where does it stand today? We ended up transitioning from the GoFundMe of giving the money to the government because we, you know, once the Democrats took control, there we realized there's no way that they were going to allow this twenty-three million dollars to go to President Trump in front of the wall. So we decided that we were better equipped to take the twenty-three million dollars and build sections of the border wall ourselves on private property with that money. And so we did that. We're doing that right now, and we just created a nonprofit five hundred one c four called We Build the Wall Inc. and this nonprofit does just that. The people can donate to it, and we go. We're working with landowners right now on the border who want border security, want protection. They're sick of waiting. They're sick of the crime. They're sick of the property values decreasing, and we're going to give them the border wall. It's just that simple. Doing it privately is no different than that's building a fence on that property. Minimal approval through the counties. Some of these counties already have coded to where you can have twenty-five foot barriers and things like that, and so. It's very simple. That's amazing. So how, how much is built? We'll start breaking ground next month. We've been through the process of securing the land, meeting landowners, uh, and just going through the entire process of permitting. And it's, it's been about two and a half months, three months now, I believe. Three months. We're chugging along. We're, we're looking to break ground at the end of this month uh, at one of our sites and some more at following at the, the previous month. How much uh, linear distance do you feel like uh, this project will cover when you're done? We're shooting to do whatever President Trump can do. To match his, like, his distance, you're saying? Uh, the government currently pays around $18 million per mile, and we can do it for between 2 to $3 million per mile at a fraction of the cost privately. And uh, like we're not trying to compete with the president. We want to supplement what he's doing and have the most border security combined between the two groups. We're focusing on areas where they're not looking at and we've been working with you know, the government. We know where they're building at and where they're planning to build out in the future. And we're going into these other areas where they're not and we're gonna get those communities border security. So we're hoping to at least get 300 miles up possibly, but we'll just see, we'll see what happens. Wow, what interaction have you had with uh, the president's team? Well, Chris Kobach, who's on our advisory board, he was one of President Trump's picks for DHS secretary. He's been our, our back door into you know, the White House, and he's had a couple of meetings in the Oval Office, Oval Office with President Trump. Uh, so he's been the one communicating. It hasn't been myself, but he's been representing us there. President Trump has openly told uh, Chris Kobach that he supports us, backs us, and you know, everyone who's donated to this, he also supports them as well and appreciates what we're doing. Got it. Awesome. So, Brian, transitioning a little bit from there, just just thinking about uh, you know your time in the Air Force, your time as a someone who has uh, was willing and almost paid the ultimate sacrifice for for everyone else in the country. You're obviously very inspired about the republic that our founding fathers started year many many years ago. Any thoughts or advice that you would give to those who are out there currently serving, whether it's as a first responder? or in the military, I mean, it doesn't matter. They're protecting the citizens from evil or from very dangerous things. Yeah, I think it's just important to remember, you know, especially the military, we all took that oath, and you know, we got the military, and I think we still need to be true to that oath to be true to our country. There's only a small percentage of us nowadays, you know, it's less than 1% that take that call 
join the military. And it's such a small percentage nowadays that, I mean, you think about you know, back in the previous world, World War One, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam, a lot of those guys were in the military and they understood what it meant. And the next generation, they just don't get it because they're not in the military. And I think it's our duty now to get out of the military to still stand up and continue fighting for our country, whether it be, you know, politically or just informing people or going and you know, joining the police force, the firefighter, whatever it may be. You know, we need to stand up for this country and do what's right because ultimately things can go, you know, haywire pretty easy for any nation. A lot of great countries have failed throughout history. Almost every power country in history has failed. You know, I think we need to take it serious because a lot of us have been in, have been overseas, been to these countries where these countries have failed. And uh, we all live in a bubble here in the United States. And our citizens don't understand what it's like to be in these other countries or be in these situations where, and frankly, you have tyranny, you have oppression, you have all this other stuff going on. And it could happen here. I don't think it's going to stop that. I mean, look at all the countries in South America. They're going through it right now. And you know, frankly, 20 years ago, I, I wouldn't have guessed that would be happening. So it's just important to, uh, you know, to stand up for our, our country, you know, regardless of you know, your skin color, political view, whatever it may be. Just, you know, just got to protect our freedoms for our, our future generations. Very well said, my friend. Thanks for spending some time here with our uh, with our group. Can you give out some contact information so that they can learn more, uh, both about the wall and about you personally and, and what you're doing so they can follow? Our website is webuildthewall.us. Webuildthewall.us. And that's basically where if you want to get involved and volunteer on a company or you just want to help out with, with the wall project, if you want to donate, um, we raised over $2 million off people getting five bucks. So if you think you can't make an impact, five dollars goes a long way. That five dollars of two million dollar donations could build a mile of border wall. Just follow us on social media, all our social media is we build the wall. Yeah, check out the website. We have an amazing team of, of members and from Steve Bannon to the angel parents who uh, lost their children from illegal aliens, Kurt Schilling. Uh, just go check it out and get involved. We're, we're, we need volunteers and we need American people involved in this project because ultimately this is the people's wall that we're building. We want everyone involved. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brian. My best to you and your family. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional, and we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.